before we get started, I guess since we're going first, maybe it'd be best to go over the overall scope of the project and for the sake of those people who haven't been with us throughout the quarter. We started out the first day of class meeting with uh, Wayne and Mark from Minneapolis to go over uh, some proposed development in the Riley area, which is just northeast of Monument Circle in downtown Indianapolis. Mark Davis, who is working with the governor on the possibilities of development in this area, talked to us uh, at length about the financial implications of a building on this site. So we have considered that as a part of at least a portion of our design, which I'll go into in a little bit. To be specific, the site, <clears throat> as I said, is northeast of Monument Circle. It's bordered by New York Street on the south and Delaware Street to the west. Both are one-way streets. And just uh, one block adjacent is the Indiana National Bank building, which stands 504 feet tall, 35 stories, which we also consider uh, as having some effect on our design. The way we went, we have progressed through the quarter. We did, of course, a preliminary site analysis. From there, we went on to uh, establish a set of given criteria, which we felt that we could judge our project by. Uh, and each group did that. We were divided into seven groups of two people each. From after uh, doing a site analysis, establishing the criteria, we evolved three solutions to the problem. From those three solutions, we chose one and developed it further, which is what you're seeing today. So just to briefly go through the program and the criteria, the program was fairly open. We had a limitation, supposedly, of about 60,000 square feet, uh, plus a lower level of parking. So from there, uh, and also, there was a stipulation that the building have some commercial and retail space. So from these constraints, our program evolved as follows. Retail space and shops, 13,000 square feet. Restaurant, 3,000. Condominiums, 9,200 square feet. Office space, 18,000 square feet. And a library and bar association club for what we would consider most of these offices would be predominantly legal oriented. Uh, the way that we came up with some of these figures was derived from a marketing study which was done for this area by a consulting firm out of Washington. We've also included roughly 25% for common space. And as that breaks down, if you uh, break it down into leasable square footage, including the parking, there's 81 and a quarter percent leasable square footage, excluding the parking, it drops to 56 and a quarter percent. And we have deviated from the program somewhat, but after doing a square footage tally before we went into the presentation, we were plus or minus about 7% from the program, either over or under in the areas we designated. The criteria that we've established as far as the project and a basis to uh, critique it on were, are listed, we have 10 basic ones. Number one, to recognize the need to create a pedestrian space, uh, which would be a place to be, or a sense of place, which is conducive to personal and group interaction among workers in the building or the people that live there in the condominiums. Recognize the need for perception of easy parking. This is something that I think everyone observed, uh, which is very unique to the site, where you have the very busy hubbub of downtown just a block away, but yet here is a, an area where you can park on the street, very nice scale. We want to retain that. Recognize the need for a perception of security. The area now is somewhat, uh, uh, it, needs, it needs taken care of. The buildings need to be cleaned up, given a crisp image. We felt that our building should also add to that so that people won't be afraid to come down there. We want to draw the people as well as having people that live and work in the building, draw people from the surrounding historic and central business district areas. 
maintain an existing human scale. This we felt has already been established by the intrinsic uh, scale of the buildings, the street, and so on. Be aware of vehicular and pedestrian traffic patterns adjacent to the site. As I mentioned, both streets bordering the site are one way, which is uh, somewhat unique. And also, the pedestrian flow from downtown and also propo proposed pedestrian flow via use of a uh, tramway, which has been proposed or is in the process of being proposed for the area to connect the Indiana National Bank Tower to Parker. Be aware of the site in relation to surrounding historic districts and the central business district. Just uh, the old north side, Lockerbie Square, uh, are within blocks from the site, so those are very definite considerations, as well as the uh, central business district. Knowledge and necessity to relate positively to New York Street as well as Massachusetts. We felt that there is a, a very basic difference in scale between Massachusetts and New York. With this being a much slower paced, smaller scale, uh, people oriented area, where this is a fast paced business vehicular zone. Two very different nodes. Consider the height relationship of the new building. It must deal positively with the scale of the IMB Tower, this building, which is just a block away, as well as that of the two, three, four story buildings adjacent to the site. Preserve the courtyard courtyard like spatial qualities of the existing block covered and present a ple pleasant image to promote an increased on-site pedestrian traffic. In other words, we want to draw as much from the different areas as possible. Any questions? Okay, with, excuse me, with all that in mind, I'll go into the building and try to explain it. Um, one of our major concepts uh, was derived from the criteria, and that was to bring into crisp focus uh, through our building uh, the pleasant scale that this street scene already has. Right? Uh, the major motif employed in so doing, uh, in our case, uh, was to use this column and slab construction uh, where the vertical elements or the columns are seen as restrained by the horizontal elements or the slabs, right? The Massachusetts Avenue side is completely given over to this motif in an effort to really break up the scale here. Uh, and conversely, the New York side, if you want to look at it, uh, needed to be larger, right? And to do this, right, we have, we really do have to look at it. To do this, all right, with the columns and the slabs coming up, right, and being, the columns being restrained by the slabs, right, that is setting up the motif of the horizontal being dominant. Also with these bands of, of what our horsemen band is, we're really trying to emphasize the horizontal. Right, but when we get up to this point, right, that's where we let the massiveness or the larger scale of New York Street take over, right? But we're still using these, these horizontal motifs in an effort to, you know, we don't want to let it get out of hand. So that's that's the rationale between you know the difference in scales and how we're trying to blend the same system into both sides, both facades of the building. Okay. Okay. Then uh, onto vehicular access uh, by bringing parking traffic in off of Massachusetts Avenue, uh, we are in effect uh, violating a minor pedestrian zone. Uh, you know, that is this walkway here, which is something that we're trying to, to preserve. However, uh, we feel justified in doing so because we are, one, taking advantage of that easy park image that we have already established as being there, okay? Uh, number two, uh, we're giving someone who is on the street and there's no parking someplace to go. So we're actually enhancing that easy park image, okay? And also, since New York Street, right, and Alabama Street are both one way, all right? Uh, using Massachusetts Avenue makes our building more accessible by taking full advantage of the traffic patterns that exist. That is to say that, you know, you can only go this way and those are both going away from our site. So it seemed only logical to, you know, make that minor violation since we already had the node of transportation with the tram there, then we, you know, felt justified in bringing uh, car traffic in there as well. Where, where does the car traffic come in? Um, 
right here off of New York Street, right, and right underneath here. Right, and it comes, you can see in the plans <coughs> that coming down off of Massachusetts Avenue into a parking lot, down into, so what we have here is a two-way system, right? You can go up and down off of either, either side. Clear? One, one more time. I lost okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, you can see it better here. All right, we're coming down uh, on yeah. right. the Yeah. All right. And right where the, where the tram stop is, right underneath that is also a convicting road. Right. And just dip underneath it in an effort to try and uh, sort of pack it away, right, and capture it and get all the nodes in the spot. Right. Uh, yes, and this is New York, so you can see the bus. We provide a maximum flexibility as well as you know, getting the maximum. Okay, uh, in terms of the surroundings of our building, in relation to that, I think we have to go back again to the way the building works visually, right? When approaching from the central business district, that is this way, okay, and on in plan this way, or this way, okay, uh, when approaching that way, one sees the larger scale facade of New York Street, right? However, from Massachusetts Avenue, you can see, uh, approaching from the Lockerbie District down here, all right, that the scale is smaller and more broken up in this courtyard. It's, it's, it's trying to break itself down into a human scale, all right, despite the fact that it is climbing higher than what's around it, which, which I'll get to. Right? So we're actually responding to the two major axes, all right, and beginning to assign them uh, a spatial meaning. That is to say, I want to associate New York Street, all right, with this facade, all right, and conversely, this this facade here wants to be associated with Massachusetts Avenue and Lockerbie Square. Okay. Uh, in terms of our relationship to the tower, all right, um, when you know, oh, excuse me. However, when driving into the site, also the IMB Tower looms. It's really ominous. It's like right there all the time. So uh, we were like, we didn't want to turn our back on the beast. Right? We're, we're acknowledging the fact that it's not a very pretty building. However, it's so big, and it is there. Uh, so for fear that it might creep up on us later and crush us, um, we thought that it would be best to respond to that. Right? So we, we do have a building that is of some height all right, to try and counteract the IMB, but uh, yet still fit in, in that we are not, um, you know, we're not actually trying to mimic the INB. On the contrary, we're trying to neutralize the effect that that building has. Excuse me? I missed buildings consuming each other. That's a very symbolic. Pardon? This, this whole notion of the INB tower coming down and consuming smaller buildings is well, rather... Well, let me explain. <laughs> I, we, we had trouble with this last time, and I want to get this clear. The, the point is that Right, when, when we're coming down the street, no matter what happens, we can always see that building in the background, all right? Granted, I did. Okay, and, and the, just the point is that I always get the feeling that it's going to crush me, all right? Yeah. And, okay. and uh, <laughs> all right, we're trying to counteract that through our building. Okay, I think the point is you've got to watch out words, what semantically how they're being read. I think when you go before public investors or bank presidents, you've got to watch out for your choice of words there. Okay, the symbolism is a little bit odd. I know this notion that at night the INB tower creeps down Mass Avenue was, and consumes new development. Okay, was that lost? I, actually, I understand what you're getting at. It's dumb. Yes. Yeah. The background and stuff, so I, I understand that. It's yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. It's, it's all right. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's certainly something to impress. It's, it's yeah. Okay. The point is the issue is, the issue is right with the, the language. It gets people off track. It distracts them. All right, excuse me, to continue. Into the plans, all right? Uh, very briefly, the plan was designed on a 16-foot grid, which was actually derived by uh, being able to base a rectilinear geometry on the dimension of the site, which worked out perfectly to a 16-foot grid, all right? Then, by adhering to that grid and using the rectilinear geometry, we're able to meet the necessary uh, efficiency requirements and still have some exciting space. And, and so that's just the basis of all our plans, right? And, and all these, the yellow area here you see is, is a common or public space, 
my core area. Our materials for the project are, uh, we chose materials that would weather, right, with the site and actually try and make the building fit in more and more as time goes on. The, the capping for all the columns that are exposed is copper. You know, the copper gets green with age and it gets that age look. It's been there forever, but rather quickly, right? And, and the limes, the Indiana limestone, which is the lighter panels that you see, is, is a similar quality. Right? And then, of course, the concrete always has that earthiness to it. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Oh, and, and our rationale for these little pods out here was that we wanted to, of course, this, our building is the focus of the street by design, right? And yet, you know, we still have to bleed out into the rest of what's around because of one of our, our concepts in the list of criteria, as you remember, was the courtyard, okay? And so by putting these pods in, we're not, we're taking away maybe one third or less of the parking on that street, all right? And uh, at the same time, we're beginning to involve the rest of the street in our geometry and give them little, like, uh, kiosks or, or places for signage out here and, and places to gather, right? And our rationale for where we put them was, right, where buildings intersect, we put a pod, right? And that seems to tie buildings together. And as the buildings are tied together, they are tied together with the geometry of our building. And that all comes back to the focus, which is here. And there's not any resentment on the part of the store owners that they're taking their parking specifically. Yeah, we're trying to, yeah, that's, that was another thing uh, based on some discussion that we had had earlier about people not, you know, wanting to lose parking. We felt that if we split it up between the two, perhaps, you know. Um, this would be what? Why, why is it out this far instead of being, you know, say, flush in the building? You've got quite an overhang there. I'm just... Why does it do that? I just... It's, it's just the geometry of the building. It's just taking that out to where it met the grid line, right? trying to adhere to our structural grid. Right? Not necessary. Is the geometry, just to follow it up, the geometry of the slab is different from the geometry of the windows. For what reason? Pardon me? Well, no, they're all based on the geometry. They're all off of a, they're all a variation of these six why is this angle different than this angle? Yeah, why are those two angles different? Uh, because it was 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right? And to be perfectly honest, I mean, that is a terrible thing to say, but at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, the angles got slow. That's a little bit different plan. We could get a little more you can see in leasable plan area if we moved we, it out. You can see in plan that it was okay. you know, provided to follow the route. I'd like to kind of address, by the way, I would hope by fourth, is that really the north elevation or the south elevation? Or was that five o'clock in the morning too? Isn't that the south elevation? It's looking north. The model's backwards with the map. Is it the south side of the building? Yes, it is the it south elevation. side of the building. It's the south side of the building, then I think you know it's the south elevation. Okay. That's it's the way the elevation faces, not the way the person faces. Right? I'd like you to, I have real problems with the column and the grid being a, something that substantiates or is drawn from the existing building because uh, I don't know where one derives that from the historic context in which one is fitting. Well, I never said that we derived it. It was a response to what is there. Right? Our, our effort is to um, achieve a, a lot of scale, right? to, to break our building down into the horizontal in an effort to get to what's there, all right? and still have something different. Something, okay. all right? Why do now, you cheat? Okay. May I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Now, we, we did it this way all right, because we could say that it was an expression of our building, all right, and it did what we wanted it to do, all right, and at the same time, it fit in with the rest of the block because we have, you know, things like that happening on a lot of these other buildings. Yeah, you do. There's no doubt that you've got this here, the engaged uh, column, okay, which is brick or limestone, and then the same uh, material on the wall. So it's really a manipulation of the wall, still basically a wall, okay. And then you have kind of uh, 
for the apertures, which are the punctured openings in the wall. So as I look at this building, I read initially this module, okay, right. or scale, and then I come down and read this secondary scale. Right. And it's all brick, sure. or whatever, normal, okay? Yeah. As I come here, I read this scale, this 32, this is what I read, okay, let me tell you what I read. Yeah. I read this 32 foot scale. Sure. Because as this and this to me are in the same kind of uh, milieu of, of brick and brick, one happens to be a positive response, the other one is negative. I read the difference between this bronze anodized, probably inch and three quarter or two inch mullion and this column as just being A and Z. Okay. Now say that again, please. Well, here I read this window and this engaged column, okay? Here are, here are two different scales, okay? Like you mentioned, the scale of this and then the scale of, I think, the right. windows, okay? Here I'm saying that for me, all of this facade, first of all, is a single entity, it's a wall, okay? Secondarily, there is this particular scaling down of it here, okay? And then, thirdly, there is the scale down of the apertures or the windows, Right. okay? And for me, those are somewhere like, let's say, L, M, and N, if I took a range. They're very close, they're all part of the same thing. Okay. Then I come up to here, and because of the change in both the material, namely concrete, okay, as this thing, then you go to some sort of a bronze, I take it a bronze anodized curtain wall system, yeah. whatever. But for me, when I read this thing, I don't read this four foot module, which I think has some relationship to this well, 1890 scale, I read this 32 foot module, okay, which to I, me is a very large scale okay. kind of a situation. Okay, um, fine. If I could explain, I think first that we're looking at the model, and perhaps in reality the mullions of the windows might be more readable in relation to the other building right, because they're just scored on the plexiglass. Number two, the building is larger, and so of course our bay is larger. I mean, this building is larger than the Budnick, its, it's bays are bigger, all right? It's also bigger than the building next to it. All right? It's what the building needs to see. And, if, and again, too, our changes in scale are more dramatic, but we have more to be dramatic about. That is to say, we have more to break down to achieve the human scale that we want. And so we make those changes more dramatic. If I could offer you the opposite thesis, because you are larger. Well, but that's the thesis that we operated on, OK? Yeah, and I'm contending that it might not be successfully oh, okay. uh, responded to. I'll offer you the opposite thesis, okay? I am larger in scale, I am larger in volume, okay? And therefore, rather than also be more detailed and truncated and broken up and, and so kind of um, lively that I'm going to, in fact, just let volume be what is going to put this in place and have already a hierarchy just by its sheer size. And I'm going to minimize all the other manipulations. I'm going to minimize the color. I'm going to minimize each bay having all of this color and porcelain enamel. And then where the column hits, I get another little thing to where not only am I now bigger than everybody else, but I'm also kind of dancing better than everybody else. Well, okay, number okay, one. And that's just the opposite thesis, and I contend that for me, you've come in here and you've really overpowered this whole block. Well, uh, again, I don't think it would be successful to come in and just let the sheer mass of it take over, right? Because that is what we did not want to do, all right? I agree. And, and I really don't see us as dancing. I think the things that we have done have been very methodical and that the facade breaks itself down in a very ordered fashion, all right? And Perhaps it does uh, speak more than the rest of the buildings around it. However, it is the focus of the block by design. All right. It, I believe, all right, and this is my belief, all right, and Phil's as well, that it should be the focus of the block. Right? Should the building be the focus of the our, block, our new, or does this space become the focus? Well, it's to me, it's all the same thing. It's it's what we have done here. All right. I, I mean, I, I think. Do you see these as answering each other at least? Right. Well, I see that I see one as helping to create the other. Okay. One can look at the building as helping to define the space. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And the courtyard a idea. Very 
background role. That could be an approach. Okay? To where building becomes a background, becomes field, and space where people are becomes figure, becomes really dominant, and the other thing becomes very recessive, very background, mm -hmm. very toned down. Yeah, yeah that's an approach, yes. I think one of the things I think that disturbs me is a little bit of a, of maybe a problem of letting the thickness of the board you used read so heavily in this model, this layering. And I, I'm this, not sure if the 16th inch, yeah. Uh, well, wait, 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 before you go on, let me say that it actually is supposed to have this all the way up, all right? Okay, this, the this, fascia or... This right, is this fascia, way. yes. From a structural More standpoint. orange? What's that? All orange? Yes. This is, we see, we see this as uh, waffle slab construction. So you've got the depth of the waffle slab. And that would be an orange pan on the outside, an orange enamel on it. Yep. <coughs> well, porcelain, yeah, that, that would be a precast porcelain, porcelain mm -hmm. panels. I, I, in reality, probably would not be that bright. That was as close as we could come to the color that we came in. Well, is that, is what we're seeing up there more of the color? This? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, it's more it's pastel more like that. that. Yeah, Wait, is the band more of that color of that brown or whatever it is? Pardon me? I see brown up there. Well, it looks like brown or terracotta. This is just the interpretation of this, this concrete kind of here. Okay. So that none of this brighter stuff appears on that side of the building. Oh, yes, it does, yes. Of course. Okay. Well, in other words, the color has not really worked out yet. Totally. Well, I, 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 I don't I want to say that, really, because I, I know the color that we wanted to achieve was more of a, a, a burnt orange rust okay. tone, all right, that would not be... I, I agree with you. It's loud, okay? But... Especially uh, if the spandrels are all going to be that color. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. It's, but... We couldn't simply couldn't find it or rust color. Let me let me just say I, I want to compliment you on the format of the presentation and the fact that you've spelled out your criteria. Uh, are the criteria listed here of equal importance or are some are they listed as the most important one first or any particular order to these? Well it, I don't oh, really sorry, think so. Sorry. It's just that they're there, and those are what we consider the important criteria. Right? And as we developed the project, we saw that scale became a more important thing okay. and so on. Well, comment, uh, when you have this number of criteria, Hierarchy. sometimes it's good to pick those out because then you can emphasize the ones that are most important to you. Mm -hmm. The two which I see coming up, the first one, which is recognized, create pedestrian space, and the number nine, which is preserve the court -like, courtyard light and spatial qualities. I think those, to me, point out, to follow up a little bit on what Tony was talking about, the critical thing here, and this is not to negate some of the other things that you've achieved, but to me, in order for this to have a pedestrian light -like quality and to be a court -like yard experience, you have to have really thought through what the activities are that actually take place there. Mm -hmm. In other words, if, if all the activities really consist of is sitting on this bench mm -hmm. and some people walking across the space, you don't have enough to make it work. Mm -hmm. There's this, and, and that, it may happen in terms of some of these activities spilling out onto this. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if one of these things was a place you could get some food or whatever, and right. that spilled out. Uh, but the model suggests, and the plans there suggest, if you have thought about it, you haven't put it in here yet, mm -hmm. okay? And I, the reason I say that is that I think it would inform this space, in other words, you get more definition. And I guess, I know you looked, you had to work on this building on a lot of levels, okay? So I know, I'm, I'm only saying this in terms of if I were a client coming in and thinking about the space, and you talk, and, and, and let's say the client had already said to you that that was the most important thing, mm -hmm. that this is what you really want to sell them on, 
that this thing really works in here, mm -hmm. he'd assume that this works, you know, and that you could work that out later if it doesn't work perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has really got to work down here. Along those lines, I think some of this stuff is happening, which begins to relate indoor-outdoor space in some kind of a way, right. I think is a very positive thing. The relationship, I mean, the use of this space is not quite clear, and neither is this one right here. Uh, we see it as potentially a place in the summertime, you know, maybe a uh, ice cream stand, or hot dog, you know, outdoor vendors. And there's also retail along here, and well, the tram is here. How would people get from here to there? Okay, the, the basis for that is that the, the tram is going to be transporting people from the bank to the parking, and hopefully when it stops along the way, we'll be at our building. Okay. So in order to get uh, either to the tram or from the tram down, you would pass by these vendors and also these retail shops. Uh, how do you get down? Come inside and there's stairs here. Yeah. Right. I think you've got to do that outside. I think you've got to do that outside. Or show. Sure. Is that mandatory? Indoor outdoor. Well, I think if it's public, you automatically... Because we have considered putting the stairs outside, but then for the reasons of trying to get exposure for our retail... Well, I think rock. you can bring them by retail. Yeah. But I think you automatically now make this lobby have to be open to our however long that tram's going to run. Yeah, for example, I, yeah. I just if the stair were in this location, let's say, you could pull people by that and on through here. And the other thing which is important, you want to get people here up to those vendors as well. You know, did you want to have that opportunity for people to sit up there, sit down here, look at each other? That's an, some of the things that begin to activate that thing. And, uh, but unless that's thought through, it can become a really dead space. I think the vendor is going to want the maximum number of people passing in front of his or her shop. Mm -hmm. So if you can say, not only do I get every 25 minutes this kind of surge of people off of the tram, but on a nice sunny day, people are naturally going to be drawn up here. Because as a matter of fact, if people would hardly know that they're going from level one up there to level two, then I think you've done a successful multi-level kind of situation where they just naturally get up there. And so often I think second level situations fail because there isn't that nice, <coughs> easy, gradual kind of notion. There's, there is the staircase and that's it. And you either go up it or you don't go up it. So maybe there's some even <coughs> some kind of intermediate leveling in which there's a vendor at the plus four level and then there's a vendor at the plus eight level and then finally there's the plus 12 level. And there's a sense of each vendor may even have more of a sense of his own place or vendors rather than saying you're either on ground level or you're on plus one level and that's it gang is you know and i think that's i think that's really kind of a very extensive study of what plaza and plus one level is and i you know i think probably given the scope of the project you didn't have but here there's this is very cut and dry notion you're either here or you're here and in fact you go into a rather almost fire stair like enclosed staircase to get from zero to one that is a fire stair, isn't it? Well, it probably would have to qualify under there if they're going to use well, a power. Well, see, but we had, we had, I mean, it's a fire Right. They have two others. Yeah, they do. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, just again, we had intentionally left the stairs out because we were trying to think as developers and say, you know, the influx of people off the tram, we want them all to come by our retail. Well, we're That's thinking, great. We're thinking, we're thinking I, as, I, I, I'm thinking as a developer also, sure. and I'm saying for me to go the out and rent, if I'm going to go out and rent the retail space or get leases on it, then I want to be able to tell a prospective vendor, not only am I going to guarantee him X number of people off the tram, but when there is a Saturday festival down here on Mass Avenue, I'm going to guarantee him 15,000 more people who are just naturally going to flow up to his shop, you know. Now, whether all 15,000 do or not, but you're going to make it sound like they're going to just be sucked up there by some mysterious vacuum, you know, okay? Is that, is, pardon my ignorance, but from a security point of view, might this actually be more appropriate? Turn the tables a there is no doubt that the, the security people would love this scheme because they've got one place to keep check on. Yeah, it's probably or two places. Security there's no doubt. Security-wise, there's no doubt. But I think as a good urban space, one that really functions, I think... Uh, well, are you saying that that's the only way that it can function, the city to have that? 
I'm saying for me, City Corp Center in New York is probably the best example of one in which takes advantage of a New York City subway stop. So you get this, in, and you know, it's a very active line. So you get this incredible surge of thousands of people per hour during the rush hour. Okay. You also get, I think, a rather nice, easy manipulation from sidewalk level. In that case, to a minus one level. And I, for one, think it's easier to get people from the sidewalk down because natural vision is this way versus up, okay? What I'm saying is, there is no doubt, I agree with you, the security guard would love this, but I don't know if we design around security guards. I'm not sure he'd love it because as soon as this is open, everybody has access to the elevators as well. That's true also. And people coming in not only... As opposed to an exterior control right. area, it's open all the time. So somebody has to either unlock or lock these doors That's true. to let people up there at all. Yeah, I'd like to keep the public out of the building right. in certain hours. Well, now, the, the people who live in the building and the people who work in the building and have offices can key themselves onto the elevators into the parking garage at any time. So it does have locking and unlocking abilities. It's not a closed system, really. Well, And two, the, the security was a consideration in what we have done. Speaking about the parking garage, I, I think there are a few of these spaces that better have Hondas or... Well, there will be Hondas, though, spaces. they won't there. That was pretty much understood, okay. with the number of cars that were yeah. in that space. In fact, I mentioned there ought to be an awareness that not all cars are going That's to be fine. two feet long. Because you better put steel around these two, I think. One question I have is you made the comment what does, that, that um, your building, you wanted your building to be the focus. My question would be, what right does your building have to be the focus of a street like this? Okay, well, we felt that um, we, we saw the site and we made our observations and we wanted to help the, the street, all right? We were concerned about the street and wanting to have a clean, crisp image, all right? And we gave part of our site to the street, all right, in an effort to try and make that better. And so just just as a... a uh, uh, a trade-off. We felt that we should be the focus. Since we were giving up part of our site, we were the new construction, all right? And since new construction is going to stick out anyway, no matter how skillfully it is blended in with the existing fabric, we felt completely justified in so doing this. If I was building, I'd sure as I could want to be the Sure. The one complimentary thing I would add is that I think you've done a nice job of tying this line around. Yeah. And I think it'd be, it's hard to appreciate looking down on it. But in looking, trying to look up at it, I think that's effective, and I think on this side it's as effective. Would this actually be accessible then? Would you have the door opening out on the little veranda or something? Yes, it would, and there would of course be railings in there, and they would also be. We could get an extra two bucks a foot for that, and then we would almost really. Those are the, those <laughs> Probably, are the yeah. two kind of many holes, kind of many to the private balcony. Oh, and get a lot more in. The thing that bothers me the most about it, and it has all semester, so it isn't anything new, is the things that I have the biggest problem with, you've done so intentionally. The, the letting it be a strong focus, letting everything really contrast with what's around it, is, is, is I think has been a strong point of the criteria, and I think you've worked very hard to <coughs> counteract that, with all, including materials, including the marble and the paving surface, including the color. Uh, that's probably my biggest problem. I think it's just a matter of thinking how many ways can we fit in with this space. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? I sure. see what you're saying, and, and the, the way we're fitting in with our ideas of scale is on another level than, than using similar materials and using okay. that, right? Um, then, then I would tend to think it's either going to be a complete success or a complete failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would go along with Tony about the scale issue. I think you can do a number of things that you want to do and really have treated the breakdown of the scale better than you did. How so? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that 32 is a magic number as far as base size. Well, no. but even if did I say it was? <laughs> well, what I mean is it could have been 16. Well, 16 is the base size. Well, it could have been expressed as 16 out here. But the notion of, of the jump uh, between scales means that you're left with either the large scale or something that is small and not perceived. 
In other words, you're really left with this larger scale. When you read this building, you're not reading a breakdown of scale, as you are clearly on these buildings. I am. It, it was designed that well, way. Where, where does it me, fail? You see, I, I don't let, me, let, me put, let me put it this way. I'm interpreting from what I know would happen if you built it, okay? Mm -hmm. You can't see much in the model at this point because mm -hmm. you haven't really put the millions in except, as you say, as a score. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of failure, total failure, or anything like that. It's a question of you read and when you look at this facade and you're trying to make this thing blend, work with the rest of the buildings here, right? Which is one of your criteria. You're reading this large scale, to the 32 foot scale. Okay, you the smaller scale is is going to be imperceivable. Okay, but can I say something? Mm -hmm. Now it was our intention to have that larger scale read, but only in so in only in so far as it is read and it is also perceived as being constrained by these slabs. All right, so it it, it, it must necessarily be perceived. Constrained by the slabs. Okay, well, can you come over here and maybe I can explain it better? All right. If I were to take away the slabs jutting out from where you were adding these columns, I'd be left with a very powerful peristyle arrangement of the columns. Right? And in my opinion, it feels as well that as we design this building, right, something that evolved to kind of counteract the scale of problems that we were having of the bigness of the building, right, it evolved into this expression of slabs and letting them trying to control and, and keep in mind also that this is actually equipped with that. Yeah, uh, okay. It it's, does exercise. Yeah, but you've still got a very wide. A 32 foot bay structurally is a pretty good sized bay. Even steel construction, that's starting to get a pretty good sized bay. It's really interesting because, and maybe this is just my, my perspective, but I almost feel that this thing without that huge grid is in better scale with some of this stuff than when you have the huge grid. Maybe it's that I, I read this little stuff here. It's, it's, it's almost just a series of lines, and then there's this kind of screen-like quality to it. But I almost get a feeling that the, that the wall, the curtain wall, has a better scale about it on that side than on this side here. And that I, think might, the, I think the difference is that here, the horizontal scale is prevailing. And that, yeah. therefore, you're reading this scale up and down the building. On that side, the, the vertical, vertical is predominant. That white really reads powerfully. Which white's that? The white columns. The columns? Very, well, very powerful. In response to what you were asking about the scale, yeah. there's no doubt that you can have the 32 foot scale. Okay? Now, you're trying to work up to a larger scale, right? What we're, what we're saying, I think, is that you, you need to show the break, a breakdown from that scale before you get to the little mullions. In other words, if you look at these buildings, there's a breakdown before you get to the window itself. There's a, there's a graduation. I, I have scale. a hard time seeing that that uh, breakdown was as carefully studied as you seem to imply. Well, I think yeah. one thing very dynamic on that facade is this rhythm that's it's not even based. There's this, there's this very dynamic. I think that was another thing that you might have used rather than just the 32 foot. Although you have it, I realize that you've used the 16, although you don't read the 16 because you, you've break, broken it into like 2, 12, and 2 or whatever. You know, the core does not get... Could this you use thing is a metal wrought iron for those white columns or something like that? Could you use something uh, like that? I think it's got to have some mint. I think it's got to be almost the notion of a structural grid out there with some modulation within the grid. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, I am paid does that very well with precast. Uh, it does what now? I am paid will take the precast concrete element and do a very nice job of modulating a facade. Very crisp, very clean, very modular. Okay, and they become, I think, very clean background facades. Things that would allow you to do a lot of active life stuff down here and not be competing all the way up the facade. I don't, you know, Obviously, I have no way of knowing how well studied this thing is. I think it's a really elegant facade. And if the guy wrapped it out in three minutes, all the more power to it. I think that thing has a lot going for it, very sophisticatedly. Including the fact that it is not equal base facing, but that the architect saw fit to do this kind of incremental build-up. 
I would guess, just by the age of the I would guess by the age of the building, it probably was very well studied. Okay, well. At least we can look at it now and probably show you what is going on. There's something that happened there. <clears throat> Phil, do you have anything to ask? Uh, to this discussion, no, but uh, we had a couple of things that we want to go over. Okay, you might try to summarize in a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you have anything else? No. Well, I just want to go over the economics. The couple of requirements of presentation were the a rough outline spec which I won't go through just for reasons of time and also room finish schedule. Uh, one part that we felt was important that I would like to go through just briefly would be the economic analysis of the building, which Mark talked about the first day of class. Uh, before I start, I'll say that it's a little bit inaccurate because we did this with the program square footage, which is not the actual square footage thing to do now would be to take, figure out the actual square footage and go back and plug numbers in and see where we can go. Uh, and we made, some, we made some assumptions in doing this. They are that we could rent the parking spaces for $45 a month, that retail and office space could be rented for $12 a month, which is premium. Uh, restaurant space would be leased for $12 a square foot plus a uh, percentage of the intergrow sales. Condominiums could be sold for $65 a square foot. Taxes, fixed costs, and operating expenses will be passed on to the building tenants on a prorated basis, and that mortgage money is available at 10.5% in the uh, form of revenue bonds. So, using, by using those assumptions and playing in the square footage, we came up with a net annual income at 100% occupancy of $474,600. Uh, figure 3% vacancy and a management fee, we come up with a net annual income before debt service of 420 thousand dollars, four hundred twenty-three sixty-two. Uh, given the ten percent capitalization rate, which we were at the start of the class, the uh, maximum mortgage would be three million one hundred fifty-two thousand seven hundred fifteen dollars. For that, the annual debt service approximately is taken from the table, not calculated precisely. I imagine that's a little bit off. It's three hundred thirty-eight thousand nine hundred seventy-nine dollars which breaks down to the annual cash flow before adjustment for taxes, the uh, net annual income before debt service, 420362 less annual debt service comes to a cash flow of roughly $81,000, uh, basing a 15% return to maximum equity based on a 15% return for the investor of the maximum. The maximum equity would be roughly $542,000 from, so the bottom line, maximum mortgage, maximum equity, and the uh, cash from pre-sale condominiums establish the maximum project cost for this site, and the determined square footage would be $4,293,000, which comes down to about 53 to 66 per square foot, which we felt was feasible uh, construction. I don't know. Could we? Sure, but can't you get some more money? <laughs> so, it's a very, very handsome little handout. Nicely done. Uh, well, we just fit under Division 14 in varying systems. Or is that going to be Elevators on a Division 14 conveying system, so does it come under electrical, or is it split between the two? Do you know? I think it comes under the 14 under conveying conveying system. And I think you've got to, you mentioned this also, I'm not sure what a precast porcelainized metal panel is. Precast normally refers to a way of casting uh, uh, concrete. One doesn't <coughs> precast. Pre excuse me. Okay. You'd have a lot of guys calling up wanting to know how the hell to bid precast and anodize. And some of them want to do it on job. Some of them want to do on job, on job porcelainization. You know, 
ovens, big mold, big ovens that go back and forth on the span wheel panels. Okay, any summary or anything else you want to add? Any more questions for anybody? I'd like to pour marble. Say what now? Can you pour marble? Oh, you shoot, you shoot for the best. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. I designed a Cadillac and ended up in the shape. <laughs> Hopefully. I want to ask this one quick question. <clears throat> Did you think about the sun in that program? The fact that that's on the north side of the building. What was your feeling about that? I think it was very pleasant this place. At what time of the year? I don't know this day. Why, why is that funny? Well, because the question implies that you really study what happens when spaces are never in the sun. And then your answer is it's going to be an incredibly pleasant space. I would venture to show you plazas in New York City that are out of expensive marble, travertine, bronze, brass, and everything else expensive, and they're horrible. The, the reason I think maybe the fact that we're so open here relatively helps us there as opposed to a compact New York situation. Well, the reason I'm asking the question is, do you know when the sun hits the clock? Not precisely. No. Okay. In, given the configuration of the building and the amount of study that you're giving to it, I would think that'd be an important criteria. I don't want to overdo that, but if I would hope that at least in the spring and in the fall, that enough sun would get into that plaza that would counteract the, you know, the kind of chilly winds that we get at that time of the year. Certainly. I mean, we have to assume that you know, with further study that could be worked out because in the design, the plaza is going to be there you know, because of everything else stacked up and that's where it happened. Right? Uh, to me, that's, see what I mean? Well, to me, and, that's an important Oh, if, what? Yeah, sure. In other words, if you knew that, well, for example, I'll just take a hypothetical. If you knew that the plaza would not get any sun from about, <coughs> you know, let's say, from about, let's say, October to April, okay? Let's say that was the case. And I'm not saying that is the case, but let's say it was. Then you'd want to do something, if you're going to make this decision, block off the sun with your building. You want to do something to counteract that or make up for that or deal with that in some other way. Either by letting sun in through from the other side or, or you know, giving some part of the plaza able to get sun but not the other part. Things like that. It's a pretty important consideration. <clears throat> well, okay. Just make me cold talking about this big box. <laughs>